I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressure. These comments marked the beginning of a years-long Cold War between the United States and its rival in the creation of a new world order. From then on, all actions by the US were defined with regards to Washington's fight against communism. US actions were not limited to confronting leftist armed groups, as former American President Harry Truman's doctrine had maintained. Yet, they pitted Washington against great civil movements and openly challenged the very principles of democracy. In the years following the Second World War, until the collapse of the former Soviet Union in 1991, the world saw many espionage operations, coups, assassination attempts, and military interventions by the US to thwart the formation of popular communist governments. President Johnson ordered Marines into the country to protect the democracy. The American nation cannot, must not, and will not permit the establishment of another communist government. Iran is the first nation to have experienced such an ordeal. In the early 1950s, the then Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh spearheaded an effort to nationalize Iran's oil industry. Thanks to his anti-colonialist policies, Mossadegh was able to muster support from so many people that he easily forced the former Shah to flee the country. The US had received intelligence that raised the possibility of a leftist republic being established in Iran. While the Americans were hosting the Shah, the CIA-led coup, codenamed Operation Ajax, restored him to power. The achievement made by the CIA officer Kermit Roosevelt was so spectacular that made coup d'etats an integral part of US foreign policy.
by now with the shooting. But here, the Muslims keep coming, and they don't give up. Later on, the Iranian people were to confront the Western Bloc once again. The Shah, who had been saved by the CIA 25 years before, was now the biggest buyer of US-made weapons and Washington's biggest hope in the region to keep oil prices low. He also served as America's bulwark against the influence of the Soviet Union and the anti-Israeli Nasserists in the Middle East. This convinced then US President Jimmy Carter to turn a blind eye to the killing of 15,000 people and the imprisonment of hundreds of thousands of others by America's favorite despot. Is an island of stability. This is a great tribute to you, Your Majesty, and to your leadership and to the respect and the admiration and love which your people give to you. Even when the number of protesters who took to the streets reached 10 million, the U.S. was still focusing on its iron fist policy. Brzezinski felt we should make it very clear to the Shah that we would not object in any way if he decided to really crack down very hard and use what Brzezinski came to call the, the iron fist. The Americans were unaware that the Shah had cancer and that he was not ready to stage a massacre as he knew he wouldn't stay alive much longer. Therefore, in January 1979, Carter sent General Robert Iser to Iran to rally Iranian military commanders and help them prepare for a last resort coup d'etat against the Islamic Revolution. My instructions were to uh, give United States assurances to the military of Iran that we would support them. His mission was to go out and see if the Iranian military had the stomach to attempt a coup and to suppress the revolution. But things did not go as the US president had desired. The Islamic Revolution achieved victory within 10 days after the departure of the Shah and the return of Ayatollah Khomeini from exile. The day after the fall of the Shah, leftist militias attacked the U.S. Embassy. Yet, the trespassers were flushed out of the American Embassy in a humiliating way by security forces at the order of Khomeini. There were enough reasons to prove that Ayatollah Khomeini was pessimistic about the communists. Even before taking power, he had ruled out the possibility of Iran turning to the other side of the Cold War. What do you say to the charges made by the Shah that you are in fact, or in effect, allied with the left with international communism? <laughs> If you succeed in removing the Shah, what sort of government do you wish to replace him? Do you want an Islamic state? The United States realized that the Islamic Revolution had not crossed the red line of communism and that Washington could tolerate Iran. However, Ayatollah Khomeini had emphasized that Iran's ruling system would be Islamic and non-secular. This persuaded the Americans that they had to continue their mischief considering that Iran was in a Muslim-dominated region and that it sat on half of the world's proven oil reserves. Carter received the Shah in the US, thus reviving the bitter memories of the 1953 coup against Mossadegh. Meanwhile, word spread that liberal Iranian politicians had met with the US officials. This rang the alarm of ousting the revolution among Iranians and prompted millions of angry Iranians to lay siege to the U.S. Embassy on Roosevelt Street.
Islamist Iranian students stormed the embassy and took hostage 66 American diplomats who were accused of espionage. The U.S. embassy seizure forced the U.S. to give up the idea of ousting the revolution and instead extradite the Shah to Iran for trial. On the other hand, Washington had imposed harsh sanctions on Tehran and had frozen $12 billion in Iranian assets to make the Iranians realize they are facing a superpower. If the American hostages are harmed, a severe price will be paid. The seizure of the U.S. Embassy marked the beginning of long-term adversity between Iran and the United States. This gradually evolved into a confrontation between liberal secularism and political Islam. The adversity also dragged other Western states as well as Islamists into the conflict and thus took on a global dimension. Late yesterday I cancelled a carefully planned operation which was underway in Iran to position our rescue team for a later withdrawal of American hostages. Eight of the crewmen of the two aircraft which collided were killed. One can imagine how painful it is for a president to hear that eight U.S. soldiers are on a mission to rescue the American hostages. A president who recently threatened to attack Iran if only one hostage is killed. The dream of adding 11 million barrels of Iranian crude oil to two and a half million barrels of Iraqi oil, which equals 20% of the total global output, tempted Saddam Hussein to invade Iran. Brzezinski's visit ignited the war. The U.S. finally agreed at the Algiers talks to release Iran's frozen assets. The Shah was already dead, but the Americans agreed to return his property to Iran. Meanwhile, there would be no apologies from the American side. The best weapons to crush the martyrdom-loving human wave are American cluster bombs and German chemical arms, which have been given to Saddam with generosity. Khomeini's devotees are just one step away from the Basra. Four years into the war, Iran has taken the battle to Iraqi soil. Under the current circumstances, the nightmare of the emergence of an Islamic Republic of Iraq is not far-fetched. The U.S. says it plans to leave Lebanon. The decision comes after a string of bomb blasts killed 260 American service members in the Lebanese capital, Beirut. This is a fiasco for the U.S. If Iran wants to disrupt the flow of hundreds of billions of dollars to Saddam, it has to infiltrate the line of U.S. warships, escorting the oil tankers of Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. The U.S. gives a crushing response to Iran's effort to directly confront American warships in the Persian Gulf. 290 people on board an Iranian passenger plane die. This aims to make Iran realize that the U.S. will support Saddam at any price. Brzezinski's smart scheme to support the Afghan jihadists was aimed at killing two birds with one stone. First to force the Red Army out of Afghanistan, a plan that worked, and second to find an alternative to Iran in terms of Islamic inclinations. <laughs> The world's fifth biggest army was defeated by the Lebanese resistance movement Hezbollah. This shows that Israel is very vulnerable where Iran is concerned. Passenger planes crash into New York's Twin Towers after being hijacked. The U.S. is pointing the finger at Al-Qaeda. Finally, Iran sees its old friends at the helm in Iraq. So one can conclude that the $1 trillion spent on toppling Saddam was actually spent to serve Iran's best interests. There was a significant escalation this year. We, first of all, they got a great deal of authorization to spend up to $400 million. 
Israel suffers its second failure to eliminate Iranian-backed movements after being forced to accept a ceasefire with Hamas following a three-week war with a Palestinian resistance group. The United Nations Security Council has adopted a strong resolution imposing new sanctions on Iran today. The adversity between Iran and the U.S. has entered a decisive stage. Iran's success in bringing the region's revolutionaries into line with the concept of Islamic awakening will transform the balance of power in the Middle East. It's this century's nightmare. Jihadism. Violent, radical Islamic fundamentalism. Their goal is to unite the world under a single jihadist caliphate. To do that, they must collapse freedom-loving nations like us. The revolution succeeded in bringing radical Islamic fundamentalism throughout the Muslim world. Some 10 to 15 percent of Muslims worldwide support militant Islam. Islam is a violent political system bent on the overthrow of the governments of the world and, the, and, and world domination. And I think we should treat it as such and treat its adherents as such as we would members of the Communist Party or members of some fascist group. In the struggle for a new world order, political Islam is now considered a rival for the United States, no matter what they may call it, jihadism, Islamism, or Islamic fundamentalism. Meanwhile, political Islam has revived the policies of the Cold War era. Therefore, democracy is a right to which the adversary is not entitled. The US and its allies will do anything they can to prevent authentic democracy in the Arab world. The reason is very simple. Uh, across the region, an overwhelming majority of the population regards the United States as the main threat to their interests. The United States has a close partnership with Egypt. Elections alone do not make true democracy. We've cooperated on many issues. President Mubarak has been very helpful. I, I would not refer to him as a dictator. But we're not picking between those on the street and those in the government. Those protesting in the streets have a responsibility to express themselves peacefully. It is the opportunity uh, to uh, work through what exists now. The Egyptian military, they wanted to defend the Egyptian people. And I think they performed in an extraordinary way. Contrast it to Iran, where the government is turned against the people. Those who want to participate in the political system must commit to basic principles. Those who refuse to make those commitments do not deserve a seat at the table. We obviously want to see people who are truly committed to democracy, not to imposing uh, any ideology on Egyptians. Revolutions in and of themselves uh, don't produce the outcome that is sought. Okay, now that you've achieved the goal of changing the government, what happens next? Uh, to result in a true democracy, not a phony one like we saw with Iranian elections, uh, not uh, to see uh, a small group that doesn't represent the full diversity of Egyptian society uh, take over and try to impose uh, their own religious or ideological beliefs. We tend to think that Muslims are stupid people, that they're going to forget that the United States supported tyranny for, for 35 years. If, if we had democracy from Mauritania to Jordan, the, the, what, those governments would have to reflect popular um, uh, opinion. And what you would have is the greatest anti-Israeli movement that you've ever seen in your life. الفريق الأولى هم الخاسرون الأصليون سقوط أو تزلزل أكثر النظم الدكتاتورية العميلة التابعة لهم وانفضاق طبيعة التبعية والذيلية للمنظمات الدولية كل ذلك قد عرض 
هذه المجموعة الأولى إلى أذمة ثقة عالمية إن مشروعية وها هي اليوم موجودية القطب الرأسمالي والنموذج الليبرالي الديمقراطي الغربي يتعرض لخطر الإضمحلال وأصبحت في وضع يشبه وضع المعسكر الشرقي في الثمانينات من القرن الماضي